thank you for being here. You can, you know, sit wherever you're comfortable. Um, we're in a different room because there's a film series happening in the room that we're normally in, which is kind of fun. This is the first time we've had a film series in that room um, with our new fancy equipment. So, um, anyway, so we are here. And we have heat. What's that? Some heat. <laughs> Do we have something to eat? No, heat. Heat. Yeah. Because we didn't have air conditioning in the summer, but, you but we do have heat now in here, and it's good. Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> um, for being here, WCTV8, as always. Um, this is the November 5th edition of Recite. Um, good to have you all here. Because of all of the weather things that happened this last weekend, um, I've been thinking about nature and the power of nature, and that made me think of Mary Oliver. So I have a few Mary Oliver poems I'd like to read. Um, this one's called The Mockingbird. All summer, the mockingbird, in his pearl gray coat and his white windowed wings, flies from the hedge to the top of the pine and begins to sing. But it's neither lilting nor lovely. For he is the thief of other sounds, whistles and truck brakes and dry hinges, plus all the songs of other birds in his neighborhood. Mimicking and elaborating, he sings with humor and bravado, so I have to wait a long time for the softer voice of his own life to come through. He begins by giving up all his usual flutter and settling down on the pine's forelock, then looking around as though to make sure he's alone. Then he slaps each wing against his breast where his heart is and copying nothing begins, easing into it, as though it was not half so easy as rollicking as though his subject now was his true self, which of course was as dark and secret as anyone else's. And it was too hard, perhaps you understand, to speak or to sing it to anything or anyone but the sky. Hmm. And then I have a couple others, short ones. This is called Heart Poem. My heart that used to pump along so pleasantly has come now to a different sort of music. There was someone inside those red walls, irritated and even occasionally irrational. Years ago, I was part of an orchestra. Our conductor was a wild man. He was forever wrapping the music stand for silence. Then he would call out some correction and we would begin again. Now again, it is the wild man. I remember the music shattering and our desperate attentiveness. Once he flung the baton over our heads and into the midst of the players. It flew over the violins and landed next to the bass fiddle. It flopped to the floor. What silence. Then someone picked it up and it was passed forward back to him. He wrapped the stand and raised his arms and we all breathed again and the music restarted. <laughs> Said these are all about nature but these are actually kind of about music which is kind of fun because i don't usually think of her connected to music this one's called schubert he takes such small steps to express our longings thank you schubert how many hours do i sit here aching to do what i do not do when suddenly he throws a single note higher than the others so that i feel the green field of hope and then descending all this world's sorrow, so deadly, so beautiful. I chose these particular poems. The others are nature-ish, but these were um, just about what we do here and bearing ourselves and opening and um, vulnerability and sharing. And I think it's a beautiful thing that we do. Um, oh, and... We've been doing this for four years now, um, which is kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
drop it. If, the if we don't around. celebrate ourselves, no one will. Well, <laughs> it's because you know we're the ones who love it. So um, it's been fun, and Yash and I have been talking lately about what recite is and um, whether or not it would be an interesting thing to talk about. Should it alter, augment, morph, grow something? If I mean, we've been doing pretty much the same thing for four years, which is awesome, and we're going to keep doing this. But there could be a conversation about whether there's other things, poetry-ish, or whatever, that we should do or talk about or think about. And um, so there's a sign-up sheet for an email list. When this started four years ago, there was an email list that Jeff maintained. Then he moved to China. So, um, but he's going to send the information back and, um, and we're going to start the email list again. And in addition to just talking about recite as it is, maybe start a conversation about if there's things other people would like to have happen with this thing or thoughts and ideas and talk about it and see what people want to do. It's kind of long-winded. I'm sort of repeating myself. I didn't really work this out. But anyway, so sign the list if you'd like to be part of that. And then we can all turn off our devices that make noises, which I should have said at the beginning, and I'll do that to mine too because I haven't done that yet. Um, yeah, hey, I'll call back. And then, yeah. okay, everyone's quiet. And, um, and we can start doing some poetry. Yes. Uh, yeah, just to uh, augment what uh, Janelle said about um, having a conversation about what recite is and its potential, uh, at the heart of it for me is the fact that I think we are doing something very special in that there needs to be in our current world um, some kind of message going out that take time to create beautiful inner space because the outer space may not be so beautiful <laughs> Uh, the way the world could possibly be heading. And, um, and this happens generation after generation. It is the cycle of life. But, and I'm going to touch on this, poetry never dies. And it's a, I think it's, I call it a life-giving tree. And to, to read and to share and to be in a poetic world is, is beautiful because it is to be in the word. And Christ is the word, I don't mean to preach, but Christ is the word we know said be in the world, but not of it. So we're in a poetic word. And um, whoever, whatever deity you associate with that, or none at all, it's still, it's a beautiful word, word to be, and I think it's a nice uh, balance, and uh, almost foil, and even better, um, antidote to uh, the ugly world uh, that can we can find so easily through the internet or um, however we find it, or however it comes to us. So uh, one kind of notion, just to give you an example of what we might do, is we, be, we might sponsor a book for a graduating senior and we give the book, but we also, it comes with an invitation <laughs> with a twist of the arm to come and share with us. Uh, just something a book little, of poetry. A book of poetry. <laughs> a little, a, a little something like that. I, I received a book of poetry as a ninth grader. I, f I forget why. I just realized it. Of Robert. Do you Frost. have the book still? And uh, uh, why would you ask that question? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But I can certainly see the cover. Anyway, that's a type of thing that's simple and easy to do. That I think. No, we don't organic have growth. If, if, if more than just Danelle and I keep this going and you that, that come and share, but if we, we, can, we can make it grow on a, uh, in a different dimension as well. So there, there's, there's no advertising, right? We, we're never in the paper. Well, right? and we can talk about that. Yeah. That's we could talk, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about. Yeah. 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 That's and what I was wondering, you know, because it, uh, I uh, uh, actually discovered I have a cousin who, whom I just met last month. And uh, he works at the Vermont Theater. But and he didn't know uh, the site existed. Uh, 
You know I existed either, but... <laughs> so, <laughs> so he isn't catching up to you. And you know what? We didn't know he existed. Yeah, right. And, we, and I didn't know he existed. Yeah. So, but I, he thought it was interesting that he'd never seen anything publicly announcing that the site existed. And, he, and he's quite alert to all kinds of... And he's interested in, we in are literature. under the radar. Yeah. And that's, maybe we need to yeah, be... I mean, I don't know how we could get it into the paper, but... Well, so there, there's, this probably isn't the time to have that conversation here now. Right. But that's part of the conversation. Yeah, that's, yeah not how to so, do it, but just yeah. as an idea. Right. And so, um, so, yeah, and so one th a thing is to maybe have a meeting sometime, you know, not during recite when we're doing the poetry thing, but just to sit around and talk about it. Yeah. Um, and it can start with the email list and then maybe have some yeah. email conversation right and then come up with topics to talk about at a you know at a get together somewhere sometime and I would I mean I would love to have people come to my house and just come oh. and hang out and talk yeah uh, in, verse, in verse though right <laughs> no. you have to speak an iambic pentameter or else you won't be listened to <laughs> Um, anyway, so so we don't know where this is going, but we're just going to start walking and see what happens. Yeah, okay. Yeah, do, so. I just don't want to lose the poetry emphasis and have it go into other things. And right. Yeah, that, which that's is, my point. Which is why we don't want the conversation to happen on this first Tuesday right, of the yeah, month. Yeah. Yeah. So Corey Cook, let's start first. So I think in, I think it was June, I, I shared a poem about going to the Donald Hall estate sale. Um, so uh, this is another attempt at that poem. Donald Hall estate sale. The line formed in front of the long face of the barn under a latticework of tree limbs, limbs etched into the sky into memory, limbs giving way to slight leaves, non-committal on a cold, cloud-filled morning, formed to the left of the ox cart, clumps of manure still waiting to be shoveled, spread in the field. Inside, the bookshelf sagged under the weight of his work. My fingers stuttered over their spines until I reached the stairs to the second floor, the stairs with the orange shag carpet, the carpet punctuated with mouse shit, remnants of unrelenting revision, commas and semicolons and periods that anchored what once was, was what was unneeded, like the hot air rising from the registers in the floor, despite all the bustling bodies, red-faced as they moved from room to room, picking things up, putting them down, bagging what they wanted. I just wanted him back at his desk, pad of paper within reach, pen in hand. Just wanted Jane upstairs in her office, glasses in place, fingers poised above the typewriter's keys. So I let myself out, stepped off the porch, followed the line to its unceremonious end. Um, this is also a, a pretty new poem. Can I ask a question? Sure. When you say, follow it to the unceremonious end, so you walked out without buying anything and you, the unceremonious end was the end of the line of people waiting to go in? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, yes. I know there's further connotations, but yes. just a literal vision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's nice. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, so this one is called Fishing. For my father, June 16th, 2019. You must be a hundred miles away, trolling for lake trout on Champlain. I can picture your freckled shoulders, the tackle box with its rusty latch, the lures, their barbed hooks like inverted talons, dangling two by two, the downriggers that will take the lines and bait hostage, drag them towards the rocky bottom, 
I can picture the open mouth of the net, its handle just within reach. Uh, and I wanted to read a poem that was, for about 10 years I worked at a not-for-profit uh, child care and senior center. Um, so I worked with a lot of different kids and there were a handful of them that came from really tough backgrounds and this poem was somewhat inspired by uh, one of their situations. A uh, third grader. The day before she drew a picture of her house and family, her, her brother, their mother and father, a blaze of red hair above his scowling face. The neighbors said it was the shrieking that woke them, that his car was missing from the driveway. The next day at recess, a classmate shoveling pea stone into a bucket paused, announced, I smell fire. Um, and I wanted to, to end with a poem by David Budville. Um, this is called More and More Now. More and more now, I want to say less and less. Chickadee, acorn squash, firewood, maple leaves, chrysanthemum. Thank you. Peter, would you like to go next? All right. Okay. Peter Fox Smith. Please, please do not impress, be impressed that I'm reading from books mm -hmm. because they are published by my family, because nobody else will publish them. <laughs> <laughs> yet. Yet. <laughs> I've decided to read poems that were written in the month of November, some of them going back 20, 25 years. How fall falls fast. How fast fall falls upon these Northland hills, their green valley metamorphosis ablaze with flames of ardent lover's lust. How fast fall falls upon green leaf of May. Place some measure next our feeble thrusts, our fantasies, our wonderings. But such detracts as cold winds carry leaves away in senseless swirls. How we cipher, how subtract, and much bemoan could have been. How fast fall falls upon green leaf of May, how quickly we come, how fast we go away. All of the next poems come from a book where I assume the voice of females. So please make sure that you don't assume that I am expressing myself. I'm expressing vast variety of females. The first poem that I'm going to read from this book, November Parks of Speech at a Rural School for Girls. What can we contribute to setting suns, snow on the grass, and not all leaves having left the trees, as we, blinded by moonless dark, 
flex nouns and verbs with adjectives submerged in interims, while no one wonders why we enact the bizarre wanderlusts in the fantasies we do. Let not the lack of light in dark night close us to enlightenments. Frost-bitten grass tops, flower tops, and urine-soaked leaves where coyotes pissed, where once howled the wolves who howl no more in our inundated hills. So now, with winter's speech, Fast upon our shoes, we pledge a diligent search for adverbs. <laughs> Brittany spills her blood. At the hospital, they sent me to blood drawing where I spilled a quart on the floor and then watched ten tykes drawing stick figures, finger painting in my blood on the floor. The nurses were so fond of the jejune art that they let it remain on the floor. Dry, blood-red figures, smiley faces, sad portraits, me, immortalized on the floor. <laughs> Mass. Ladies wear a mask hoping to deceive. Men wear a mask hoping to relieve penis pangs past monkey to man since ambling down limbs to deface the ground and to make females rock and roll rhythmically pleased belly to butt locking limb with limb Masks on or off, discounting not. To enter is to go in. The naked and the nude revisited. Poor Robert Graves. Spent 24 lines in meter and rhyme trying to define the difference between naked and nude. I'll do it in two, simple, short, and sweet. Nude is naked without heat. Naked is nude with an attitude. Whiskey Wilt's wife. Wilt relies on his whiskey each day at 5 p.m. to wash him far away from dirt of day. Work, news, small talk, incessant prattle of those who clutter his life from 8 a.m. on with boredom. Whiskey at five revives his lost life. Whiskey time for wilted wilt. Whiskey, uskaval, water of life for his seer self. Whiskey to make him whole sprouts her wings and with fire heats his cold, forlorn heart awaiting woes of wife.
Excuse me. Regina's will. I dislike dreams that into cesspools drip, leaving me scorned and simply to sit pondering if something somehow might have some meaning for me when I know the answer is no. Poetry has its own rules, but they ignore me as they must. So what is left? Not much, but not nothing. Faint abstractions are perceived as we capitulate. So thus, I will leave all I have to you, all, all, everything, even my dreams, old or new, warm or cold, wet or dry, false or true, weak or bold, and those forgotten dreams languishing wistfully in commingling clouds. Two more. Linda sings. My mind may be a wrinkled mass, my heart less held and hovering, but I sing of sea coasts, mountain tops, old shoes. I sing beyond rudiments, requirements. I sing above all expectations. I sing of love to reprove all else, or at least to prolong his holding me, postponing bitter ends. And the last of the November poems is entitled Songs Written for an Octet of Women's Voices. Honored speculations of disembodied time, nature is in meter, dressed elegant with rhyme. We watch leaves expire brown, yellow, orange, and red, with gold or scarlet trim spinning through our head. And listen to the fauna make music without a score, chickadee sopranos, vaso bears, deep roar, honored speculations, of disembodied time, nature is in meters, dressed elegant in rhyme. So those books, could the library buy copies of those books? Do you have extra copies of them? They've been donated to the library. Oh, they're here? Yes. Awesome. And they are being sold at the bookstore. Oh, nice. At, at least I'm told. <laughs> but the royalties are not coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Self-published books, yeah, it's hard with the royalties <laughs> thing here. <laughs> um, Chuck Gunderson, would you like to go next? Sure. My poems are not in a book because even my family won't publish them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the only they way should. I get my poetry out out there. This is this one is mine, but I have a couple here that are not mine that I really admire. This one is called uh, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades, Four Poems. Look, Mick Jagger wrote this. Wrote what? This, see? This, he wrote The Head's Broken? That's right, Mick Jagger wrote that. And then he signed it, see? 
Mick Jagger wrote, The Head's Broken? Why would he do that? My father asked him to. Wait, your father knows Mick Jagger? No, they saw him on the street, and my mother recognized him and asked for his autograph. He asked what he should write, and my father said, The Head's Broken. So he wrote it. <laughs> when was that? Yesterday. You know who was here a little while ago? Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was here? Yes, he was. He was painting. He was here yesterday and today. How long ago did he leave? Oh, perhaps 15 minutes ago. Will he be back tomorrow? Oh no, he's leaving for England this evening. But he stood right there where you're standing now and he shook my hand and he said goodbye. You just missed him. <laughs> <laughs> A girl called for you yesterday. Who was it? She didn't say. <laughs> well, what did she say? Nothing. Just asked if you were here. What did you say? I said, no, of course you weren't here. So I said, no. Did she say anything else? No. Did she say she'd call back? No. Did she ask when I'd be back? No, she just asked if you were here. What did she sound like? I don't know, just some girl. <laughs> Did her voice sound familiar at all? No. Nope. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize I was so close to the edge. Christ, I'd still be falling. <laughs> Horseshoes and hand grenades. <laughs> this one is one by Carl Dennis. I got this from Bruce Coffin. It's called Animal Husbandry. Isn't it time to mention the millions of animal innocents allowed to drown in the story of Noah? The millions sacrificed as collateral damage when Yahweh decides to drown mankind? Can so gross an act of injustice be allowed to pass without an apology? The next edition should at least contain a chapter on what it felt like for Noah and family to enter when the flood receded, a world of empty fields and forests, of empty sky. And then a longer chapter on the remnant pairs returning to habitats devoid of their kin, the strain of two bees trying to be a hive, two prairie dogs toiling to be a colony, and consider the lonesomeness of the dove sent from the ark to scout for land as it waited in the reeds for the ark to open. Then imagine it darting off with its mate, quick to put as much distance as possible between them and Noah's family. Who knows when the god of humans might strike out blindly again in all directions, as if the world were to blame for his failure to plan on the sixth day of creation the last two creatures as carefully as he planned the others. And then his failure to observe them at least a year in the garden before he urged them to fill the world. Carl Dennis. And this one, which is sort of the other side of the coin, but actually maybe it's just the same coin. This is by Thomas Hardy. It's called The Oxen. Christmas Eve and twelve of the clock. Now they are all on the knees, an elder said, as we sat in a flock by the embers in hearthside ease. We pictured the meek, mild creatures where they dwelt in their strawy pen, nor did it occur to any one of us there to doubt they were kneeling then. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years, yet I feel if someone said on Christmas Eve, come see the oxen kneel in the lonely Barton by yonder coombe our childhood used to know, I should go with him in the gloom, hoping it might be so. Hmm. You probably knew that one. You were an admirer of Thomas Hardy. I love Thomas Hardy. Yeah. Every word of yeah. his novels and his poems. Yeah. He's right at top of my all-time papers. Good, solid pessimist <laughs> who really understands what's going on in the world. I guess you do too. <laughs>
No, I, I met Yash at the hardware store a year or so ago, and he said, you should come to, to recite. And I said, well, I, I, I don't really write all that much poetry, and you know, I know poet people read their own stuff largely. And he said, no, you write all that other stuff. So read, read one of those things. So that's what I'm going to do. One of those things. Uh, I write for the Vermont Standard. For years I wrote a weekly column. Now it's not, not as regular. I just write it when I feel like it. And I wrote one that was in the paper last week that, that was about my past lives and having fun with, with past lives. And that made me think further about reincarnation. And I started writing this thing, which I realize is pretty convoluted and pretty dense. So I'm not sure I'm gonna send this to the paper because I have a feeling that people might get started on it and after a paragraph or two, just throw up their hands and say, oh, I can't, I can't make any sense out of this. So since, since you're a captive audience at this point, I'm gonna try it out on you and if anybody throws up their hands and walks out, then, then I'll know. <laughs> well, we just had for a second drink, that's all. <laughs> This, I call this written by one or the other of me. The most interesting of my past lives was the time I came back as identical twins. One of those things you would think couldn't happen, but reincarnation is a funny business, and when you think about it, it actually makes sense because identical twins start out as one egg, and well, to make a long story short, my mother had twins, and they were both me. Both of me were born in 1916 in Plymouth, England, where I'm almost always born. The fellow I'd been in our previous life died of a broken heart because the girl he'd married in that life, who was the girl he'd married several times before and also didn't marry several times before, didn't like a story he'd written for her. Anyway, I was reincarnated as identical twins born to parents who had no idea that both of us were the same person. So, of course, thinking I was two different people, they gave me two different names, although I never could remember which of me was which. Anyway, by the time I was in my 20s, during the Great Depression, I had emigrated to the States, and so had I. I was working for the CCC, helping to build the Blue Ridge Parkway, and so was I. <laughs> Both of me met a girl, the same girl again from my other lives, of course. She was a waitress at a diner near our camp. I fell for her immediately, as I'm fated to do, and so did I. Both of me were crazy about her, but she showed a distinct preference for me, which made me very happy and made me very unhappy. I was heartbroken, as you might guess, and so was I. But at the same time, I felt that exaltation you feel when someone you love loves you, and so did I. So being a sort of literary fellow, as I often have been, I wrote some poetry for her, and so did I. I wrote the poems on slips of paper and folded the slips of paper and slipped them to her secretly, and so did I. Now, you would think that since I was both of us, and I was writing the poems, and I was writing them as well, that the poems would come out exactly the same. But that didn't happen. The poems I wrote were much different from the poems I wrote. <laughs> They were much better. I was a much better poet than I was. I began to hope that in the next life I would come back as one person and not as two. I mean, since there were two of me and both of me would be reincarnated, it stands to reason that there would be two of me again in the next life. It weighed upon my minds. I worried over it constantly and then I had a terrible thought. What if both of me came back as identical twins? It happened once, it could happen again. There would be four of me, four of me, and I knew that that girl was going to show up again, and all four of me would fall in love with her, and she would have to choose between four of me. I began to suspect that perhaps this reincarnation business was not all that well thought out. Well, she solved the problem, she chose me, and what could I do? I bowed out gracefully and moved to Powys in Wales leaving me and her in Plymouth. 
Life was quiet in Poas and things went along well except that I had a recurring dream that the girl had also been reincarnated as twins and that I would meet her and marry her and then both of me would be happily married to both of her which was a moot point since I being me I already was <laughs> although she was with me instead of with me. Anyway, after a couple of years, she realized that she couldn't live without me, so she left me in Plymouth and traveled to Poas to be with me. She told me that she loved me, but that this life was kind of hard to deal with. She liked the other lives a lot better when there was just one of me. She said it just goes to show that you can have too much of a good thing. <laughs> As for me, after she left me in Plymouth to be with me in Poas, I pined away and predisposed, I guess, genetically or karmically or kismetically to do that sort of thing, I died of a broken heart. My funeral was very strange, all those people crying on my shoulder and telling me how sorry they were for my loss and also telling me what a wonderful guy I had been and that I was one of a kind and there was no one else quite like me <laughs> and that they were going to miss me terribly. I considered trying to explain that there was someone else like me, it was me. And I was not actually dead since I was alive. And even though I was alive, I might possibly already have been reincarnated since as well as being alive, I was also dead. But it didn't seem like the time or the place. <laughs> Although we intended to stay in Plymouth since everyone I knew was there, we decided to return to Poets since everyone I knew was there. But before we could leave, there was an air raid and we couldn't get to a shelter in time and that was the end of that life. <laughs> Which, if I'd been alive to think about it, I would have thought was quite reasonable since I was already dead and had no business being alive. Don't be sad though, not for me anyway. Be sad for all those other innocents who met the same fate in that war, or in any other war for that matter. Anyway, that was the end of 1944 and I came back right away just one of me as far as I know. I'm enjoying this life. It's so much less complicated and I'm in no hurry to get on to the next one. My one regret is that I'm not as good a poet as I was in that life. I mean as good as a poet as I was, not as I was. <laughs> and I have to admit that it does worry me a bit when someone says they met someone who was the spitting image of me. I just hope it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, nobody walked out? <laughs> the mystical voice must have talked to me because in preparing for tonight, I rejected a poem on Noah's Ark and I rejected a second poem on that we're all made of atoms. Atoms are indestructible and therefore are our immortality. I'm glad you got that message so that I could have those things. <laughs> I'm glad you got them too. <laughs> those things are in the air, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, and so we'll then have Richard and then Yasha at the end. <laughs> Yeah, it, um, Mary Oliver is awesome. Her stuff is, it's simple um, and absolutely profound at the same time. And this, um, whatever I'm going through in life, it seems to just like be like right there. This one is called Black Oaks. Okay, not one can write a symphony or a dictionary or even a letter to an old friend full of remembrance and comfort. Mm. Not one can manage a single sound, though the blue jays carp and whistle all day in the branches without the push of the wind. But to tell the truth after a while, I'm pale with longing for their thick bodies ruffled with lichen. And you can't keep me from the woods, from the tonnage of their shoulders and their shining green hair. Today is a day like any other, 24 hours, a little sunshine, a little rain. Listen, says Ambition, nervously shifting her weight from one boot to another. Why don't you get going? For there I am, in the mossy shadows, under the trees. 
And to tell the truth, I don't want to let go of the risks of idleness. I don't want to sell my life for money. I don't even want to come in out of the rain. Hmm. And this one's called, How Would You Live Then? What if a hundred rose-breasted grosbeaks flew in circles around your head? What if the mockingbird came into the house with you and became your advisor? What if the bees filled your walls with honey and all you needed to do was ask them and they would fill the bowl? What if the brook slid down just past your bedroom window so you could listen to its slow prayers as you fell asleep? What if the stars began to shout their names or to run this way and that way above the clouds? Clouds. What if you painted a picture of a tree and the leaves began to rustle and a bird cheerfully sang from its painted branches? What if you suddenly saw that the silver of water was brighter than the silver of money? What if you finally saw that the sunflowers turning toward the sun all day and every day, who knows how, but they do it, were more precious, more meaningful than gold? There's Mary Oliver. Now, we'll go to Richard Esty. Sunflowers stop turning their heads when the seeds get heavy, if you notice them. Yeah, it's hard to look at. Once the seeds <laughs> come out, then they stop. <clears throat> I'm going to recite two poems to begin with. First one is um, My November Guest by Robert Frost. My sorrow when she's here with me thinks these dark days of autumn rain are as beautiful as days can be. She loves the bear, the withered tree. She walks the sodden pasture lane. Her pleasure will not let me stay. She talks and I am fain to list. She's glad the birds are gone away. She's glad her simple worsted gray is silver now with clinging mist. The desolate, deserted trees, the heavy sky, the beauty she so truly sees, she thinks I have no eye for these and vexes me for reason why. Not yesterday I learned to know the love of bare November days before the coming of the snow, but a vain to tell her so. And then the second poem is, it's out of this little book I got a while ago, Water at the Root. It's a, it's a section of poems and essays by a um, uh, man named Philip Britz, who was a member of the a Bruderhof colony in England, Malmesbury, England, during the Second World War. And... Um, because the Bruderhofs had had their origins in Germany. They were persecuted in Germany. Many fled to England. And then, of course, then because Germany was causing the war, uh, they were a suspect, suspect in England, and therefore many of them went to South America. So, um, and of course they were pacifists, so they didn't, you know, they didn't sign up to fight in the war. And Philip, with about another group of men in the colony um, signed up with the government to um, help clear land and plant because you know there was a food embargo and the, you know, the, the Germans were keeping them from uh, from the English from importing food so this is a poem it's called the song of the ditch hedges and ditches and supposedly what Philip did was said to the other men in the work crew each of you think of a line of a poem, and we'll, then he took all, each one line, put them together, and this is the poem. I, th I spoke to North by heart, but I have it here just in case. The Song of the Hedges and Ditches. When the earth is sleeping, when the fields are bare, with low wheat peeping in the bitter air, forth we go at sunrise in the frosty morn, with our hooks and shovels on our shoulders borne. Deep we dig the ditches so that waters flow. Low we lay the hedges so that shoots may grow. Home we come at sunset 
weary shoulders bent, but the land will blossom from the strength we spent. And then I've mentioned a few times that um, I um, subscribe to a poem a day, you know, you do emails, and actually I, in November last year I read a poem from uh, Poem a Day, and in November 3rd this year, ah, there was one worth reading, and the uh, curator for the poems for the month of November is in indigenous American Indian living in Arizona. And this poem he chose for November 3rd is called Dignity, and the poet has two names. The first name is Tunqua Ste, born in the Cherokee Nation in Georgia in 1829. He was also known as DeWitt Clinton Duncan, and he worked as an attorney for the Cherokee Nation, as well as a teacher for Latin, English, and Greek. He, so he, and he died in 1909. And the name of the poem is Dignity. What, and what, in fact, is dignity in those who have it pure? It is the soul's repose, the base of character, no mere reserve that springs from pride or want or mental nerve. The dignity that wealth or station breeds, or in the breast on, on base emotion feeds, is easily weighed and easy to be sized, a bastard virtue, much to be despised. True dignity is like a summer tree, beneath whose shade both beast and bird and bee, when, heated by the, when by the heated skies oppressed may come and feel in its magnificence at home, or rather, like a mountain which forgets itself in its own greatness, and so lets vast armies fuss and fight upon its sides, while high in clouds its peaceful summit hides, and from the voiceless crest of glistening snow pours trickling fat fatness on the fields below repellent force that daunts obtrusive wrong and moves the timid steps of right along, and hence the garb which magistrates prepare when called to judge and really seem to wear in framing character on whatever plan tis always needed to complete the man. The job quite done and dignity without is like an apple pie, the fruit left out. Uh, and then, uh, I didn't know until it nearly happened that we no longer have Columbus Day in the state of Vermont. We have Indigenous Peoples Day. The first time I noticed it was on the Indigenous Peoples United Bank sign. It said, you know, on their door it said Indigenous Peoples Day, they're going to be closed. So, um, I wrote a little poem about it. Goodbye, Columbus. Your discovery day is no more. We honor the indigenous from Sam's Lake's shore. Here in Vermont, now, the caring flatlanders rule. You, sailing the ocean blue, were wicked and cruel. If only you had stayed in the land you called home, or walked east like saintly Marco Polo from Rome. Royals, Isabella and Ferdinand, you deceived them, but all the poor indigenous, pure indigenous, you diseased them. Oh, how happy and peaceful the indigenous were, innocent, freedom-loving, they never heard of war. The indigenous were one with nature and the environment, living off and in tune with the land, full of contentment. But ruthless Chris stormed their halcyon shores, bringing horses, cows, and houses with doors. The rapacious Europeans overran the indigenous peoples, imposing whiskey, firearms, and buildings with steeples. Finally, here in Vermont, thanks to our progressive legislature, our authentic indigenous are honored 
as models of human nature. So, Christopher Columbus, goodbye. Your discovery day is erased. In Vermont, we, the invasives, proclaim Indigenous Day, your day replaced. If you want to see, hear another version of it, look up Joy Hajo. She's written a poem, which I read today, maybe, or a couple of days ago. And it has a lot of the same themes in it, which I didn't realize until after I've written mine, but it's over on the same page. Even though Joy Hajo is the Port Laird of the United States, and I'm with the guy, oh, that would be that. But thank you. <laughs> As the college students say, you're freaking me out, all of you. As I was putting together what I was going to read today, I thought I would end by reading Robert Frost's My November Guest. And so I read it for you. <laughs> I read it on your mind. <laughs> all of you have decided <laughs> what I was going to do today. <laughs> so, Synchronicity uh, well, with this. I, I didn't have it on my schedule, but <laughs> when you said you were going to read poem from November, I said, ah, I'll say that one, because I, I had it memorized. And so so you, you inspired that for me to read. Well, I didn't mean to freak you out, but, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> well put, Yash. Okay, and uh, and on this note, Peter, I I do hope to sing above all expectations. Oh, thank you. You're gonna sing. <laughs> well, poetically. Okay. <laughs> and uh, to continue the um, the swirling oneness, I suppose, of us all here gathered, and if there's anybody watching. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, I too was thinking of Noah's Ark uh, this past month, and I, I also wrote a poem because I thought about the dove. I don't know. I don't know where this came from, but I'll read it. And it is entitled "The Holy Spirit." She circled around man's pride, hovering around the old man, Noah, and his ark all the animals and the family. She held in her beak a, a torn olive branch. She could return and let them be themselves. She knew what the olive branch signified, a land in which to copulate, to live as they had and as they would with mercy the mercy that would flow from her son's heart when embraced to the tree of man's hatred of change and forgiveness, the tree of pride. She trembled. The old man looked up and reached. The father of us all spoke from above. You are all that I have, my meekest dove. So, uh, what was I going to do? Well, that was what came to me uh, to be included and perhaps to sing at least above your expectations. <laughs> and uh, I do have a, a Roki poem. The only poem I have to recite is, uh, is a Roki poem. And. Um, but on the theme of expanding the recite, uh, I had written a poem after my talk with Donnell, and the theme about possibly somehow making recite and what we have here grow. And this is the poem. Poetry never dies. It is the stock of reality, of love manifest. Upon the whisper of a woman's lock, a new world war will turn, and she will love. Her next lover, and the bird in the nest, whose flight no mental net can ever block. So who can imagine, 
bombs from above. Violence is violence. Let it rest out of sight of innermost thoughts, my dove. No, no, that free bird you can never shock. For as long as you read it, poetry never dies. It is a life-giving tree. And, oh, hearken, step up, learn to recite. Your world shall tremble, a world to delight. Okay. So, to delight my own world, uh, uh, this is a Rilke poem. It's number five from Sonnets to Orpheus, and it just blows me away at how it envelops, from what I can see, all of us in, in such delicate beauty. Uh, and it goes like this. How does it begin? I'll remember it. Uh, oh my God, how could I have forgotten? Uh, I was, I've been reciting it like every day for two months because I missed <laughs> October. And now I'm drawing a blank. Um, it ends with, the first line ends with, sorry, Danelle. Uh, the meno. oh, okay, got it. Here we go. Flower muscle that opens the anemone's meadow morning bit by bit until into her lap the polyphonic light of the loud skies pours down. Muscle of infinite reception, tensed in the still star of the blossom. Sometimes so overmanned with abundance that the sunset's beckoning to rest is scarcely able to give back to you the wide sprung petal edges. You resolve and strength of how many worlds? We, in our violence, are longer lasting. But when, in which one of all lives, are we at last open and receivers? So, sonnet number five. And now, um, I, was, I had hoped Bob Burgess would be here to help me read from Moses and Israel, because uh, it's a very challenging uh, little section I have. I'm continuing to revise. Chuck, I don't know if I've bragged to you about this, but um, <laughs> I've written a, a long poem about mm, basically, uh, it, it, it turned out, it didn't start, uh, but it turned out to be sort of cover the whole Torah. Uh, um, in other words, well, no, no, no not the whole Torah, because the Torah includes Genesis, but anyway, the um, the call of Moses from the burning bush to uh, uh, the crossing of the Jordan by the Israelites. And um, I'm continuing to arrive at chapter a month. And this one, um, I, I was pretty excited about because I saw some things that I hadn't seen when I had originally uh, written it. And um, so here's the revised version. <clears throat> Chapter 14. Why should I let your people go? shouted Pharaoh at a stunned Moses. The wonders of your odd cod, all along I doubted. I was right to do so. On my orders, royal archivists searched through our records. They have found the Nile has often turned red, often has had abundant frogs. These words myself I have seen. Egypt's king gestured at an elderly man holding open an old papyrus scroll. I will not be misled by nature's commotions. Threaten no more. Your people never will be free while they slacken and dream and disobey. 
Hearing the words of Pharaoh thunder with righteous anger, Moses just turned away, sunk in spirit, with diminishing faith to the heart of the Lord. Without delay then, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, raise your staff and strike the earth's dust today. Strike the earth's dust to become gnats upon the land throughout Egypt. Moses, silent, bowed before Pharaoh and left his chamber. Aaron, too, took his leave silently, went with Moses past smirking guards, yet slower, unsure what to think. Outside the palace, Moses told Aaron what the Lord had told him. Aaron then himself felt the Lord's grace. He gripped the staff without need to feel bold. Strike, Moses repeated. Aaron did so. From all the dust of the land issued gnats upon Egypt, not from the Nile's soft flow. From the dust itself, gnats swarmed upon cats, on beasts, men, and priests. The magicians came unto Pharaoh, and all in one accord proclaimed the plague, and to escape from shame, the finger of God, and bowed to their Lord. Then one in blackest garb, laced in starlight gleams of thread and silken embroidery, sniffed when they were far beyond Pharaoh's gaze. Gnats. How demeaning, what a mockery. All the others leaving, a distinguished herd for the guards, the guards kept their stations, mumbled agreement, followed in a hush stream with some murmuring incantations. Meanwhile, gnats upon gnats bit, crawled upon men and women, old and young. They swarmed in choirs, matting in common and uncommon places, temples, harbors, every basin. Pharaoh was incensed, as was his chamber, to make it a refuge from the gnats. There he paced to and fro again. None other than me is he attacking. I am here as Egypt incarnate. This Hebrew slave sucked at the bosom of the queen mother he thinks arrogantly that lets him have dominion over me. Though the river turns blood red and the frogs pollute the land, my people are not his. We shall endure. A wind from our gods shall render his hand impotent. This must happen. And so sure Pharaoh was the next day, implacable he appeared at court though suffocating some in thick clouds of incense, but able to take pleasure in a liberating breeze that carried the gnats away. The same breeze carried the Lord's word to Moses. Rise up early in the morning. The words came through his mind's veiled folds of consciousness. Rise, present yourself to Pharaoh when he goes forth to the water and say to him thus, the precise command poured as water flows down a dry riverbed into Moses. Thank you. Great. That'll do it. We made it to seven o'clock, even just with six of us. Awesome.